during the Stalinist purges, uh, quite a few great artists, uh, writers, free thinkers were uh, sent off to Siberia and to their eventual demise because they were um, considered rootless cosmopolitans. That was the phrase. Um, I've always liked that phrase. Uh, at the time, I think it was meant to connote people who were not uh, unswervingly loyal to one party, one place, uh, and ready to shout out the world, but rather felt comfortable in the world, moved around in the world, and uh, knew their way around the world. I first began to notice uh, Pico Iyer's writing because um, he uh, began to evoke very much the image of that kind of person. Uh, I also noticed him because he wrote a great piece on a working friend of mine, Leonard Cohn. And then as I was about to embark on a short trip to Cuba, my assistant, Anthony Quinn, passed me a little volume called Cuba and the Night, and that was the first book of Pico's that I read. And then lately I've been looking through The Global Soul, uh, in which Pico advances the theory. I don't want to give your speech for you, Pico, but uh, that Canada, that, uh, Toronto, is uh, the prototypical country and city of the postmodern era for the reason that we have gathered many rootless cosmopolitans in this place. Pico, will you come and <coughs> tell us more? Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Well, it was only yesterday when I arrived that I found that almost all the presenters at this conference are actually Canadian. And so I think just by virtue of coming on this stage, I've attained my lifelong aspiration, which is to be an honorary Canadian. Um, <laughs> even, even though, or maybe because of the fact that uh, I was born in England to Indian parents, grew up in California, and live now in Japan. Uh, but Moses and, uh, and Jennifer invited us to, I think, just talk about some of the ideas that have been haunting us recently. And I think one thing that I've been thinking a lot about is the ways in which human beings are living in ways they've never lived and scarcely even been able to imagine in history before. Uh, they're flying across five continents in an afternoon just to do the basic human things, to visit a mother or to take the kids on vacation or um, to do their jobs. Uh, they're waking up in the tropics and they're having lunch that same day uh, in a snowstorm. They're flying across the North Pole, as I did when I was small, just to go to school, even though we weren't an especially affluent family. And at the same time, they're doing all this while being bombarded by more images in a day than a typical Victorian saw in a lifetime. And so, just as Moses said very well, I've been thinking quite a lot about what I almost regard as a new breed of people who are living in the cracks between cultures and who are having to and able to almost construct from scratch their sense of tradition, their sense of community, their sense of home. It does seem to me that most of us in this room probably have opportunities that our grandparents couldn't have imagined. Uh, indeed, I suppose I, I sometimes think in this context of my grandparents, uh, and all four of them were born not very, very long ago in India. And I think when they were born, all four of them had a very strong, perhaps oppressively strong sense of where they belonged, what they believed, who their friends were, who their enemies were. And they imagined, and I think they were usually right in the imagining, that they'd spend all their days within a relatively close radius of where they were born. And now in just two generations, it's all up for grabs. Uh, so that the simplest questions in the world um, become ever more complicated to answer. Um, as I said before, I was born in England to parents, both of whom came from India. We moved to California when I was seven, and so literally from when I was seven years old, if somebody came up to me and asked me this fundamental question, where do you come from? I, I really didn't know what to say. Um, if I said I was an Englishman, they'd think I was a fraud. Didn't look like a traditional Englishman. Uh, if I said I was American, I only had to pull out this little pinkish thing in my wallet that said permanent alien. Um, I couldn't call myself an Indian because I'd never lived there. I didn't speak any one of their languages. And when I was growing up, I always thought this was a relatively rare and, and privileged position to be in. But now when I walk around the streets, of course, of, of Toronto or Vancouver or Sydney or Hong Kong or half the major cities in the world, half the kids I see are much, much more mongrel and international and heir to many more traditions uh, than I am. So that I often think of that image when one's in a plane and 
the cabin attendant passes out that disembarkation form, and there are very small spaces left for these very simple questions, uh, citizenship, home address, final destination. It's actually harder and harder for more and more of us to fill in um, the requisite answers. Uh, and, I, and I suppose one reason I've always been interested in Toronto is my sense that every time a Torontonian goes to Thailand, say, as is more and more common, and marries a Thai woman, or every time a Chinese family comes and settles in Vancouver, that children who are growing up in those households represent to me something entirely new and different and, and a new sense of possibility, not entirely Eastern, not entirely Western, but with all these various cultures clashing and, and conspiring within them. And I see this as in potentially a, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, if I define myself as an Indian, in some ways I'm defining myself as someone opposed to Pakistan. Uh, if I define myself as a Canadian, I'm not an enemy to anyone, except the US maybe. Um, but anyway, it's a way out of, out of the old um, oppositions, I think. Uh, and of course, you don't have to travel at all to realize that all of us are surrounded by this ever more pressing question, which is how we come to terms with the other, how we make our peace with the alien that has come right into our neighborhood. I could imagine somebody who'd never left Toronto all her life, still lives in her grandmother's house, but when she goes down the street just to the corner market to buy a carton of milk, She's surrounded by people speaking Cantonese and signs in Urdu and uh, the customs of Rwanda and, and Bosnia and Barbados and places that when her grandmother was growing up were on the far corners of, of the world. We're moving around the world, the world's moving around us. Uh, and it means that all of us are more surrounded perhaps than people have ever been before by what we can't understand. Uh, and I think this goes to what Anna was saying about anti-Semitism. We're confronted with the other and we have to try to come to an understanding with with that other. Uh, even if you're in a village in Bangladesh today, uh, you may get, see an occasional visitor from Germany, uh, you may see videos from Hong Kong, there may even be a phone call or a rumor of an email from Toronto. Even in a remote place, you're being visited by all the other corners of the world. And when I use an example like that, I think what also strikes me, as it struck all of you, I'm sure, is that this new kind of global existence is taking place on two levels at once. And I've been talking about people like me and probably like most of you who are lucky enough to be able to enjoy the whole world as a backyard in a way that wasn't feasible 50 years ago. But at the same time, of course, there are more people than ever before propelled out of their homes, addressing the same questions in a much more aching and undefended way because they're sent out of their homes for the age old biblical reasons almost uh, because of poverty or or famine uh, or war. Uh, the number of refugees in the world has actually gone up tenfold um, just since I was in high school. So that if you took all the Canadians in the world and all the Australians and then all the Canadians again and all the Australians again, you'd still have fewer people than our refugees in the world. And you know, we read about them every day, these, these rending stories of people clinging to inner tubes or hiding in refrigerated trucks or doing anything they can to get to those places that in a global neighborhood seem next door and yet in reality are, are very, very far away. And so I think when I coined this term global souls, it was partly because of my sense that um, in the last few years global had become the very cool or hot uh, term that we attached to everything we wanted to make seem desirable or attractive. Uh, and yet it seemed to me it nearly always had to do with things that were rather soulless. Um, the body shop, the nature company, the sharper image. I mean, the, the, the words themselves are somewhat chill and, and, and displacing. Uh, and our companies were telling us a lot about how the world was knit into, into a single unit, but sometimes that just seemed to be a way of saying that the world was a single market and they had uh, enormous uh, global reach. And so I suppose in recent years I've been thinking about how globalism plays out on an individual level, at the level of the imagination, not in terms of these grand geopolitical forces, but how it affects our dreams, how it changes uh, our sense of the family, how uh, it challenges and, and forces us to refine our sense of, of self, uh, and how we're addressing questions that didn't uh, even exist a, a little while ago. Uh, and needless to say, I feel a little embarrassed even saying any of this to, to all of you in this room, because my sense is that Canada has been addressing these issues for decades, even though the rest of the world is only just beginning to wake up to, to them. So whether it's Pierre Trudeau and Marshall McLuhan and Northrop Frye remembered in the building around the corner, or these days Naomi Klein or Anne Michaels in a different way, Canadians have really tried to work 
to, to figure out a way to make this congregation of nations something different from and maybe better than what has existed before. So anyway, as I've, I've gone through my life um, playing with these various ideas, uh, I came up with an idea of my own, actually prompted by a Torontonian a few years ago. Um, crazy idea. I wish I'd never done it, and I don't wish it on any of you, uh, except maybe Douglas Copeland, who could do something wonderful with it. Uh, and that is that I went and actually lived in an airport for a while. And I took the airport as a model, not an inspiring, but perhaps a realistic model of the city of the future. Uh, my sense is that cities are coming to look more and more like airports. Toronto is a, is a good example in that cities are becoming sort of aggregations of people from all corners of the world, often on their way to other corners. It, the cities are becoming enormous transit lounges sometimes. Uh, and at the same time, airports, as all of you know, are, are more and more like cities. They have mini golf courses and microbreweries and porno cinemas in them. They have rainforests and chapels and gymnasia. Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth Airport alone is larger than the whole of Manhattan. Uh, and I'd also noticed, um, lucky as I am to travel, that when I was going to a relatively obscure places like uh, North Korea or Easter Island or Ethiopia, some of the interactions or incongruities I would run into in the air airport en route were just as exotic and unprecedented uh, as what I'd see at the other end. Uh, and I also, a few years ago, I actually calculated that uh, I spend 40 days uh, a year in either an airport or an airplane, one of these nowhere places, not really home, but not really exotic, neither here nor there. Um, and that comes to six weeks of a, of a year, which extrapolated across a lifetime, could come to 10 years of my life that I would be spending in what's the sort of physical equivalent of jet lag, jet lag being the kind of neurological equivalent of those gray, long airport passageways. It's a foreign country that nobody had ever seen until 40 years ago, but it's a foreign country that's so new that many of us are spending our lives there without ever really stopping to think about this altered state in which we're living. My friends who are in business regard me as a stay-at-home. They probably spend you know, the equivalent of 20 years of their life in airports and, and, and airplanes. And one of the things that was interesting to me about the airport, and it sort of dances around some of what we've heard the last two days, was that it seemed to be one of the places um, in public life where these two levels of globalism uh, collided. Because I think those of us who are relatively fortunate, to some extent, live in the metaphorical equivalent of an airline. Six miles above the ground with everything brought to us in the comfort of our seats, uh, excitingly surrounded by uh, foreigners and foreign tongues, not really under the jurisdiction of, of any nation, and yet perhaps ever further away from the vast numbers of people on the ground um, who, as I said before, are, are crossing borders but with nothing to protect them. Uh, and one of the other things that struck me as, as interesting about the airport was that of all the sites in public life that I could think of, it was the one that was the setting for the most passionate, emotional, private moments. People were kissing and kissing in airports and sobbing and sending loved ones off to war and meeting parents they hadn't seen for 30 years. All these great human dramas that wouldn't have been strange to Homer or, or Chaucer or somebody in the first century were brought up against the force of the 21st century because all the dramas were taking place in what's often just a sort of grid of food courts and video arcades and, and, and shopping malls, all these very unconsoling and displacing uh, phenomena. And of the airports in the world, I, I chose Los Angeles, uh, partly because more than any place I knew, it seemed to be rather an interesting terminal of dreams. And this goes back to what Anna was saying before, which is that more than anywhere I knew, it seemed to me that people were coming to Los Angeles carrying almost in their suitcases, certainly in their heads, all the images they'd seen on screens, large and small, heard on songs, all that they'd observed, absorbed for years of, of this land of abundance and pro promise and, and reinvention. And in some ways, as soon as they landed, they were brought up face, uh, slap up against the, the press of the American reality. So that I could imagine sort of hypothetically uh, a Tibetan perhaps who wanted to escape uh, what he regarded as the Chinese oppression of his homeland and he would slip through the Himalayas, make this very um, dangerous and, and, and arduous trip, get to New Delhi, get on a plane, fly through the day and the night and the day, get out in Los Angeles airport, walk out into the bleaching sunlight and half the faces he sees will be Chinese. Um, now, he would be sensitive and, and sensible enough to know that those individuals have nothing to do with the, the government that he's escaping, but at the same time, you can see in a very poignant way, almost on his face, 
the recognition that he's committed himself to a dream that is radically different from what he imagined when he was sitting back in Lhasa. And I think the airport is not only a way for us to consider the kind of questions that are coming in on us in, in, in the coming century, but also a reminder that the world, in, in my experience, is not actually getting smaller. In some ways, cultures are, are further and further apart, um, and the illusion of smallness almost intensifies um, the problem. Uh, I was in, in Vancouver, actually, a month ago, and I was just thinking there, I came up with the example there, that uh, I remember when the movie The Sixth Sense was very popular a couple of years ago, and I saw it in, in Japan, uh, and there, what seemed most terrifying to the people in, in The Sixth Sense was not the ghosts, because they're more than familiar with ghosts in Japan, but the psychiatrists. They're not familiar with psychiatrists in Japan. That's just not part of their culture. Um, there are other countries in the world where I could imagine in that movie the, the notion of a single mother would be very unsettling. Uh, and then I went back to California and I saw the same movie there, and the Californians just seemed shocked at the notion that Bruce Willis could act. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it was an example that in some ways we're all taking in the same image, but we're seeing a different film. Uh, and, uh, and that uh, in, in some ways, George Bernard Shaw, you probably remember 100 years ago, said England and America were um, countries separated by a common language. And I think now the world is often like 200 cultures separated by a common cultural language. Where all perhaps eating at McDonald's, wearing Nike, and watching Jennifer Lopez. But Jennifer Lopez means something quite different in Saudi Arabia than, than she does here. And when you're thinking about it culturally like that, I think it's often fairly amusing, or at least uh, full of diverting incongruities. But when you come down to the human level, uh, again, it's much more poignant. Um, Moses mentioned uh, Havana, Cuba. And I remember when I was in Havana a, a few years ago, uh, I was talking to some kids near the university, very intelligent, worldly wise, spoke good English. Uh, and one of them asked me where I came from, as Cubans always do, and I said, California, which is the right answer. And he said, wonderful, I've, I've got a brother in California, and he's got this big house and swing pool and tennis courts and limousines, and I'm really, really hoping my brother can do something, anything, to get me out of the difficulty and privation of Havana and, and, and into the freedom of America. So please, when you return, will you take a letter for him? So I took this letter back with me, along with the T t dozens of other letters I'd accumulated over the week. And even though I knew from five previous trips to Cuba that when I sent these letters out, most of them would come back to me saying, address the unknown, or some would arrive on the doorsteps of Cubans who, having escaped, never wanted to hear about Cuba before or again. Um, some would arrive on the doorsteps of Cubans who weren't even alive because Cuba hadn't prepared them from some of the more difficult parts of, uh, of New York and Miami. But in this case, to my amazement, a letter came back to me within a week. Uh, from a place I, I'd never actually heard of before called Tamal in California. Uh, and it said, Dear Pico Aya, thank you so much for forwarding the letter. I, I think about my brother, I think about Havana all the time, and I don't know if he knows or if you know my circumstances here, but I'm in San Quentin prison and I'm on death row. And I'm really, really hoping my brother in Cuba can do something, just anything, to, to get me out of America and back to the Havana I miss so much. And any of you who travel know that these kind of things come up a lot when you're uh, on the far corners of the world. And whenever I hear that the world is getting smaller, I just think of two brothers in nations only 90 miles apart, ostensibly, neither knowing the first thing about the other's circumstances, and yet each more achingly longing, looking to the other um, for a kind of rescue. So I guess the question is, what do we do with all of this? And I think one reason that I've always gravitated towards Canada is my sense that Canadians want to turn this reality into a possibility. And one reason I was so eager to come to this conference was that it seemed like it was an act of um, consecrated idealism, in a way. Uh, and my sense is that the hope in this situation actually lies in, in that case, me able to go back and forth between the two brothers, but in all of you who are probably privileged enough to get to, to travel around the world and privileged enough to come to Toronto on this occasion, people going back and forth, bringing just what little they can in the way of con contact or information or friendship between cultures that don't seem to me any closer than they ever were. And my sense is that governments and corporations uh, uh, will always be hemmed in by their interests and ideologies, but my experience is that individuals are often much wiser than their governments, can see beyond that, can come to a much more nuanced and subtle understanding of other cultures, and actually can go and put a, a face and a voice uh, to the other. And my sense is, too, that people in the poorer parts of the world can't come and see North America firsthand, so it's up to us who have the time and resources 
to go and see them and to try to make a bridge and to try to make good on all the promises that we see in the ads for the phone companies and, and the plane companies. And we, we heard some powerful information yesterday about uh, September 11th in Afghanistan. Uh, and my red light's on, so I'll just wind up by saying that a little bit of what that story seemed to me to be about was a small group of Islamic radicals tilting against America, the symbol of geopolitical might or the source of promiscuous pop culture, but not beginning to think about just the human reality of America. And America, in turn, responding to an Afghanistan that it knew nothing about through a, a president who'd seldom been abroad and a, a CIA that didn't even have a Pashto speaker in, in, in Afghanistan. Uh, and when, when those events broke out last fall, I felt myself lucky in a small way, only because I'd spent a lot of last summer in traveling around Arabia and particularly in uh, Aden, in the southern part of Yemen. And when I'd been in Aden at the age of two, in 1959, it was the single largest port in the world outside Manhattan. As many of you know, it was a center for the British Empire where ships traveling between Britain and India would stop for refueling. Uh, when I went to Aden last summer, it was the most desperate, disenfranchised place I, I can ever imagine seeing. Um, no shops, no houses, no restaurants, no, no anything. So goats foraging. Uh, on the main streets when an occasional car would stop at a red light. Sunken-cheeked old women would come and, and hammer at the windows asking for a handout. The shelves of the global order were there, but it was almost worse than if they hadn't been there. There was a Federal Express office, but you could tell it would never open. There, there was an airport, but I don't think many planes took off from there. Certainly mine didn't. Um, there was a Sheraton Hotel on the beach, but every time you stepped into it, you had to walk through one of those security machines that you find in, in airports. And so when um, the planes went into the World Trade Towers and suddenly Yemen, among other places, became the lockers of all evil from the point of view of America, uh, it's the place where Osama bin Laden was born, it was the site of the most recent uh, terrorist attack on America, the bombing of the USS Cole, I just felt glad that I was able to put a face to the Yemenis to remember those people sitting more or less in rubble in the middle of the main street, the last thing on their minds being wanting to harm America, not least because so many of them probably had relatives in Manhattan and, and for all I know in the World Trade Center. And so I think one thing that I've heard a lot from the environmentalists yesterday and from the wonderful presentation from the Islamic woman this morning was our sense that I think during last September and October, many of us had a great sense of powerlessness as we just sat and watched in the screens the planes crashing into the into the towers and then the bombs being dropped on Afghanistan. And yet my sense is that we do have a, a, a sense of power and we do have, those of us who are lucky enough to have the resources, we do have the chance actually to, to make a difference and to try to work around the divisions that governments create. Uh, and so given that, as I see it, we have opportunities that our grandparents could never have imagined, it seems to me a shame or maybe even a crime not to make the most of them. Thanks very much. Thank you.